Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another one of my podcasts. So this week, I've got a, a load of different things for you. I'm going to talk about when my next proper diving video is going to come out. I'm going to talk about some risk, and this is kind of building on the conversation that I had with with Akim over the weekend. Uh, I've got. I'm going to talk about how many how you manage risks and how you balance risks. And I've got a few really interesting stories there. Some jellyfish stings, some out of gas situations, and how I manage the bailout settings on uh, my different computers, my handset and my uh, my offboard shearwater. So those are, those are all coming up. The other thing I've got to do is remind you, obviously, that I've got this lovely Orc Torch uh, D710, which is there to be won. Um, it's going to be uh, allocated at the end of the month, so that's not that far away. So if you want to win one of those, uh, the, the way to do it is in the, the description. So please, uh, please have a go. It will cost you nothing and those sorts is lovely and it may be winging its way. Right, okay, so let's talk about my next diving video. I know it's about a week and a half since I've done one. I kind of, I try and do one most Sundays. So I've got one lined up for, for this Sunday. And it's a dive I've done fairly recently, although it's on a site I've done a number of times before. It's the HMS Stockforce, really, really interesting wreck. Um, really interesting story. It was a Q-ship, so it was uh, effectively a, it was used as a lure to try and get German submarines to come in close. It had loads of disguised weapons on it. When the Germans got close enough, they would drop all their, um, uh, all the things hiding the guns, and then they would engage in a battle with it. So the stock force, really famous. The captain of it won the Victoria Cross, which is the highest uh, British Medal for Gallantry, so equivalent to the Congressional Medal of Honor, uh, to use an American example. So really interesting story, really interesting dive. I was present when we found the bell. Not not this dive I've just done, but I've got some pictures of it that I'm going to show you. I'm going to talk a bit about that as well. So that's coming out on Sunday. I think you'll really enjoy it. And the, the dive we did on it was, was great as well. So um, please stay tuned for that one. But the thing that I really want to talk to you about this week is about risk. Now, it came up in the conversation with, with Akim uh, on Sunday, and it's that thing, you know, diving always carries risks. And the deeper you go, the more the risks are going to be. Now, sometimes trying to address one risk will create another risk or will increase another risk. So we talked about it in the context of carrying lots of cylinders. So my view and the view of lots of other people around here is that about the right number of cylinders for diving in UK waters is two. If you carry more than two Alley 80s, uh, getting in and out of the water becomes really tricky. And if you fall over, for instance, or you can't get back on the boat, particularly in an emergency situation, for instance, that risk is intolerable. And you can mitigate the, the risk of not having enough gas during the dive in other ways. So that's that's kind of how we balance that risk. But but that's not the only example of this. So one I particularly want to talk to you about is, um, well, I've got a few different ones, but the one, I, the one I'm going to talk about first is decompression illness in the context of a, a bailout. So we, uh, like most people, I use gradient factors to uh, add conservancy to my dive profile. If you don't know what gradient factors are, they're effectively a way of adding a bit of conservancy in against the, the, the pure Bullman view of uh, when you're likely to get DCI. If you don't know what that means, um, I'm not going to do a, a full lesson on it, but essentially uh, Bullman was a, um, a scientist. He produced a model for decompression illness and, and effectively if you go um, exceed a line, then his view was that was when you were likely to get decompression illness. So if you stayed below the line, then you were okay. Gradient factors effectively amend that line and um, add in extra conservancy. So in, in really, really basic terms, that's, that's how they work. And they're used on most uh, dive computers. Um, most rebreather manufacturers will use a version of the Bullman algorithm to, to determine when you're going to get decompression illness. So Routinely, uh, when I dive, I my personal gradient factors, I use 60, 80. So 60 uh, modifies one end of the line, 80 modifies the other end of the line. And in big hand terms, you would say that that biases the dive more towards spending a longer time shallow than uh, spending more time deep. 
And that's kind of pretty much in line with, with modern thinking on gradient factors. Um, I went to Rebreather Forum 4 well, about two years ago, actually. And, and the view there was that, was that deep stops are no longer a thing or you know, can, can generally be discounted. Um, that was by some of the top decompression scientists in the world. And therefore, if you were to ask them what they dived, they dive 50, 70 or 60, 80 or some sort of version of similar to that. I go with 60, 80 because um, that was the recommendation that the British Tobacco Club did uh, a few years ago. Uh, on the basis of some advice from a guy called Gavin Anthony, who's really well known in, in decompression circles and diving safety circles. He did an analysis of all the literature that was available, and that's what he came up with and said, for trimix diving, that kind of is a good balance. So you know what? I, I haven't got the time to do what he did, so I, I went with his 6080. And some people, you may take a view on that. Yeah, there's loads of stuff on the internet. You will find some people say that's too aggressive. You, uh, if you actually uh, speak to some people, other people will say that's unnecessary. You're padding your stops out too much. Okay, uh, you know, probably both of those are right in, in different circumstances. Uh, I've used 6080 for a long time. It works pretty well for me. So most of the time, 6080. Um, however, if I bail out, I do not do 6080. I uh, do 1995. And so that is much, much closer to the pure Bullman uh, view. And therefore, I have removed some of the conservancy. So I've increased my risk of decompression illness, but I'm going to be getting out of the water a lot quicker. And my rationale behind that is um, decompression illness is entirely treatable on the surface. There's always oxygen. There's always access to recompression chambers, all those kind of things. Um, but drowning from running out of gas is, you know, there's not much you can do about that one. So I, I balance the risk um, in that particular scenario. I want to, if I've bailed out, I want to get out the water um, as quickly as I possibly can. So that is, that is my view. That's what I adopt. And to kind of facilitate that, um, there's a couple of different things. The, uh, the first thing is the particular rebreather that I use is uh, an AP Inspiration. And on the, on the AP Inspiration, you on the, the modern handset, the 2020 handset, you can have a separate setting for bailout gradient factors to your actual dive gradient factors. So that's, um, that's what I have set. So I know if I bail out on my handset, on my, on my AP handset, I'm going straight to 1995. That's going to get me out of the water as quick as I can whilst uh, minimizing, you know, or, or putting the risk of decompression illness within a tolerable amount. So that's a good example of how I manage risk underwater and I use uh, gradient factors to kind of do that. But there are other situations where you want to, might want to do that something similar. So about, uh, I don't know, five or six years ago, I was diving on a, a wreck that we thought was a submarine. Turned out not to be a submarine, turned out to be a freighter. And you can see it, uh, it's one of the earliest videos that I posted onto YouTube. So I'll put a, uh, I'll put a link to it. And as we were coming, it was 100 meters, it was, it was horrible conditions. The, uh, it was on the North Channel, which is uh, the bit in between Northern Ireland and Scotland, which is notorious for having rubbish visibility and also really strong currents. So the, the window of slack, even on a, on a good neeps when we dive, it was really, when we dived, it was really small. Anyway, we're coming back up. In fact, we're going down to start with. And on the way down, uh, we wanted to get down as quickly as possible. Only one person had a scooter. That was my mate, Scott. So he, um, he towed, we're diving as a three. He towed th the other two of us down the shot line. So I'm, I've grabbed hold of his right leg, I think, or uh, my mate has grabbed hold of his other leg. And as we're going down, there was a load of jellyfish in the water, really big, horrible ones. And as we were going down, um, the jellyfish were going past us. Anyway, it didn't think anything of it. Got to the bottom, did the dive, found it wasn't a submarine, found it was a freighter, which was, which was interesting in itself. Um, never identified it. Anyway, we're coming back up again. And on the way back up, we go through a load of jellyfish again. Anyway, once again, thought nothing of it. We get to um, about 20 meters. So we've done, it wasn't a long bottom time, but we've done a few minutes of stops. And uh, one of the guys I was with pulls out his underwater slate and writes on his underwater slate and hands it to me. And I was like, oh, you know, maybe he's written something about how rubbish the dive was or, you know, it, 
even getting on it was a bit of an epic. So maybe he's written something about that. Anyway, he hands the slate over to me and I read on the slate. And, and I have to say, even now it's, it's, it's making me laugh. He wrote on the, state, uh, on the slate, badly stung by jellyfish, whole body on fire, exclamation mark. And I'm like, well, that's brilliant because we've, we've got an hour or 80 odd minutes of stops to do. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm really sad for him. That's, that's really, really sorry to hear that. But, um, you know, what, what do you expect me to do? Um, and, then, and then actually it came to me because uh, this was at the end of quite a long trip. Um, we, we'd done um, a week at Malin. So this was our eighth day of diving. And uh, we'd been talking about risk and various other bits and pieces. And I remember that we'd had this discussion about changing your gradient factors to uh, balance risks. So for him, you know, it was clearly important that he, he needed to get out of the water as, as quickly as possible. Uh, when I spoke to him afterwards, he told me it was horrendous. He uh, was feeling sick and uh, he, he, he got it all, he got it on his mouth actually. So it was his lips uh, and, and, and we could see it all on his loop actually once we started to look. And so he was concerned about vomiting, clearly on a re, uh, vomiting open circuit, not too much of a problem. Vomiting on a rebreather is a big issue. You don't want to get it in the rebreather loop. So you kind of have to bail out vomit, um, which obviously, you know, sometimes you involuntarily take things in and everything. So it's unpleasant and you then have to go back on the rebreather. So some people, uh, if they think they're going to vomit, they bail out, they, uh, so onto an open circuit reg, they vomit and then they bail back onto to their rebreather if they feel okay. But anyway, so... He wanted to get out of the water as quickly as possible. We'd been having this discussion about using gradient factors to do that. So I said, you know, remember, um, uh, you know, um, 90, and uh, you know, nine zero, and uh, I was pointing to my computer and he went, ah, yeah, got it. And he then changed his gradient factors underwater, uh, which you can do on a shear water. Um, and, and he used the, uh, the gradient factors on his shear water to get out of the water quickly. He couldn't change his inspiration. So he just, you know, effectively chinned off some of the, the, the decompression that the inspiration wanted him to do. But he used the, the gradient factors on his shear water to get out of the water. And it probably, you know, didn't make a massive difference. Maybe got him out of the water 10 minutes early. But he was, he was really pleased for that. Got back on the boat and, uh, and obviously, uh, you know, wasn't concerned, therefore, about the risk of vomiting. He could have vomited over the side or whatever. So it, it worked out really well for him in, in that particular situation. So it's a good example of how you can balance one risk against another. Um, and I guess I offer that to you as a something that may be useful to you, you know, if you are in a situation where you need to get out of the water quickly. I mean, there are, there are plenty of other examples where you are, you know, you consider the risk of extra decompression illness is uh, less important than the risk of whatever this other thing is going on. So for instance, if you, uh, you know, are getting really cold, for instance, um, that may be a situation where you want to do that. Obviously, the, the, the challenge with that is um, you are off gassing much slower if you're really cold. So it's, uh, you know, it's one of the things you might want to balance. It may be that the cold becomes intolerable and you know that you're going to get on the, on the boat, in which case, you know, any of these situations, actually, it's probably worth, if you uh, think that you are at high risk of decompression illness and you've got onto the boat, then I really strongly advise getting on pure oxygen as soon as you can and consider whether you need to be getting to a chamber. So uh, there's a few different, few different things there to, to kind of consider. So I hope that's useful to you and, and kind of interesting and, you know, expands a bit on the discussion of risk that I had, that, uh, that we had at the weekend. So I'm going to move on now. I'm going to talk about this thing here. So the Orca torch, it's a, it's a lovely torch. Um, if you haven't seen my video about it, I would really encourage you to do that. And if you want to win that one, once again, the thing's in the description. I explain how to do it. It's simply a case of joining the Deep Wreck Diving Group on Facebook. And I'll, I'll draw somebody's name out of the hat at the end of the month. And, some, and I'll send that to them and, and they can get it. So um, you know, hopefully a few of you will do that. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about is that Orca Torch have sent me another, another torch. So this is, uh, is very similar to the, the D710. This is a DC710. And the reason they call it DC is because you can actually uh, charge it. I don't know if you can see there, there's a kind of uh, USB-C charging slot. 
so you can charge it without needing to take the torch apart. I think that's a really nice little uh, uh, piece of functionality. The other thing it does is it comes with this lovely soft Goodman handle um, and that is that is a really nice uh, touch actually. So on my stock force dive I actually dive with that on my on my right hand and I use it and, and I show it and obviously I'm going to put together another review video but you'll see it being used on the stock force dive and it's a really really nice bit of kit. Right the other thing I was going to talk to you about was my diving plans and the really good news is I am going diving this weekend. I've got three days of diving Saturday, Sunday, Monday. I'm going to be going out with Indeep uh, here in Plymouth. We're going to be doing some sort of 70 meter stuff. Not 100% certain what it's going to be yet and uh, but we'll find out um, in, an, in the next few days where the weather call is, is made. But hopefully it'll be something good. Hopefully it's something, I'm obviously going to get some more video. So hopefully it's something that you will see me, me, me push out in the not too distant future. Um, the one kind of downside is there's definitely elements of the plankton bloom around in Plymouth. We, we are getting into that kind of time of year. So it may be that what I just end up doing is diving in a whole load of green snot. In which case, that doesn't make a particularly good video. In which case, you ain't going to be seeing it, I'm afraid. Um, but I may have some photos, I may have some excerpts and video that I'm going to show you. But let's let's see how it goes. You know, the weather looks good. Hopefully it'll be nice and sunny. So if nothing else, it'll be a good day out on the boat with a load of my mates. So that's everything for this week. I hope you've enjoyed uh, another canter through a whole load of different things. Hope you find it interesting. And um, I'm probably going to do it all again next week. So hope to see you there.